What's your minimum specification? I want, to, I want to speak about Next Generation Wormhole. It's You presented it recently at the, um, or Tennis Tournament presented it recently at the uh, Lindley Conference. We're talking about a single chip with, uh, as I said before, 1,600 gig Ethernet ports and four ports on each corner of the chip built out into this massive 2D mesh. Hmm. You Scale. I, I know we've spoken about scale going from you know, the hundreds to the millions. Is, is a 2D mesh still scalable out to the millions? Is that still relevant for AI workloads? Yeah, Luigi, you want to take that? It's... Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's a, it's a loaded question. I mean, it, it depends a lot on on, ex, on the, the workload that you're, you know, that you're running and the, the sort of prototypical mega workload of today is these transformer models, so stuff like GPT-3, uh, GPT-3 probably is the the most famous, you know, member of the of that family right now. And uh, the, the the way people tend to to organize those is that it's it's basically a a, a bunch of replicated modules. So these modules uh, usually there's encoders and decoders. So there's two flavors of them, although they're very similar. And then there's just a stack of these, a, a long stack of them. So in a f for a model like that, you can really Take the 2D mesh very, very far, right? and the the questions that uh, that arise are, uh, well, you know, how does the the that module that encoder fit onto your hardware architecture? So usually, for for most other architectures that that we have been watching, uh, you know, you want uh, pretty high bandwidth communication within the encoder or within the decoder, and then the the bandwidth need on the boundary of these blocks is kind of more limited. Let's say. So, so what's emerged is uh, solutions where you'll have a, a shelf, which is like a 2U or a 4U computer that you're going to place uh, or, or a 6U in, you know, like in, in, the, uh, in, in some cases. But bottom line is you, you have a computer and you map one of these blocks onto them. And then there will be network communication between these computers and they coincide with the, the edge boundaries there. So one of the messages we tried to, to give it at Linley was that this need to to match the the encoder or decoder module to a computer is potentially detrimental so it's a boundary that forces model designers to you know ad ad adopt a certain set of sizing and a certain model architecture in order to fit the computer so one of the things that we did is that we removed that boundary and we said well we have this you know uniform grid it's really large you can basically place the entire pipeline onto that there is no bandwidth cliffs. There's nothing that you really need to be super worried about, you know, as, as you're designing models. So one of the big messages that the guys at Linley tried to give was that we've attempted to unconstrain the model designers from this, you know, kind of limit of one box per one module of, of your model, which which has emerged. And um, so long as models don't change hugely, the 2D mesh you know, abstraction is likely to hold up pretty well. Like the models themselves are 2D-ish. They're kind of left to right, more or less data flow. You, you don't see a lot of random connections kind of skipping around from the beginning to the end of the model and so on. And so long that holds, the 2D mesh is a pretty good substrate. Yeah, you know, there's a funny thing, like your brain is, I, I just read this recently, is, you know, your cerebral cortex is 1.3 square feet. And it's mm. essentially, it's a flat, thin layer. It's, it's, it's six neurons high, but it's built out of these columns of about 100,000 neurons. And it's very uniform. So it's, it's a little 3D-ish. It's sort of like, you know, very big in two dimensions and six deep in the other dimension. And, you know, that's been stable for, you know, like hundreds of millions of years. <laughs> so. There's also been hundreds of millions of iterations of getting it wrong, though. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. That's why, you know... We're iterating every year, and you know, we're going to be at this for a while. It's it's, it's pretty cool, but but there's you know, the, the mathematics right now is being formulated as two D matrices, and the two D mesh is natural for that, and the way the graph compilers you know partition stuff is pretty natural for it, and then the you know the n cubed over n square works in our favor, but getting rid of the artificial boundaries like you only have eight chips here. 
like we're building this really cool box with wormhole with with a lot more chips in it but it has enough bandwidth that we can then make that as part of mesh going forwards and then there's trade-offs about well what if one of the shelf breaks and how do you repair it and like how do you want to build the mesh and people have yeah. lots of different opinions about that and and essentially at that level we're flexible but um but yeah there's something I mean, powerful about meshes and you know and then you got to do a lot of work on reliability and redundancy and rerouting there's all kinds of interesting details on the, 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 the skins there uh, I mean, with 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 the two D mesh, and it's great that you bring up you know this sort of next six neuron high th uh, mini three D. Is there any desire roadmap you think on under AI compute to move to a more three D style compute? Well, it would be natural for us because our tensor cores are actually big enough that they could do the local you know three D a little bit. So if somebody wanted yeah. to say, I want this mesh to be a couple layers deep, like we could do that pretty naturally. 